Hi, it's Bob Hoopscher, and this is the Gaining Perspective Podcast, where we bring you insightful conversations with some of the top thought leaders in the investment advisor profession and investment management industry. I'm the founder of Advisor Perspectives and a vice chairman of Vetify. Artificial intelligence has been a category killer among investment themes in the past year. Its impact on the wealth management profession has been profound, from gravity-defying value creation on the stock market to optimizing the day-to-day operations of an advisory practice. Every participant in financial services in companies large and small needs to embrace and integrate this powerful technology into its future or risk falling behind. My guest today, Valerie Talma, will share his perspective on the state of the art in AI investment management and how advisors can serve their clients better with AI-powered strategies. Valerie is the President and Chief Revenue Officer at Queensfield AI Technologies, where his mission is to empower investors with cutting-edge tools and insights that enhance their performance and decision-making. So Val, I'm going to ask you to start off by telling me about your career and why you joined Queensfield AI Technologies. And one thing that I noticed when I was reading your bio last night is that you're a former Navy officer in the French Navy and you're a veteran of the NATO campaign to liberate Kuwait. I'm interested a little bit in that experience, but how you transitioned from there to Queensfield. Well, Bob, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for having me on this podcast and giving me a voice. It's a pleasure to be here. You've singled out part of of my life, which has to do with France. Uh, France is a wonderful country and France is a wonderful democracy. And France used to have a mandatory military service when I grew up. And I enlisted in the Navy and I became an officer and I was trained. And when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, my ship was the first one to set sail across the Med and across the Suez Canal. And this is how I took part in Operation Desert Desert Shield and and Desert Storm. And yeah, it is something I'm proud of. So uh, thanks for noticing that. You're welcome. Back to the more mundane um, life of uh, professional uh, developments. I have a background of over 30 years in investment banking and capital markets, having worked for groups like JP Morgan, UBS, HSBC globally. I used to structure large debt and equity capital markets and mergers and acquisitions transactions. That was my job. Five years ago, for um, family reasons, we moved to the US in the Silicon Valley, and I became fascinated by the promises of artificial intelligence, especially as applied to investment management. I, I, pros- I proceeded to educate myself in computer science and artificial intelligence at Stanford University. And I became an investor and an executive in um, AI, fintech, and investment management firms. So uh, quite, a, quite a career change. This is how I met the founder and chief executive officer of Queensfield AI Technologies, a visionary Frenchman who spent his career in some of the most senior positions in investment management and research, and who devoted the past eight years of his life building a truly unique platform of science and technologies applied to investment management. So Arnaud and I decided to team up and to introduce Queensfield to the US investment management market. And as you mentioned, our our mission is to bring the most effective AI-powered portfolios to the wealth management industry in a way that is simple, actionable, and cost-effective for advisors. So by way of background, let's start off by having you tell me what the most promising applications for artificial intelligence are now in wealth management. Uh, What should advisors be paying attention to? Sure. There are three areas where AI is creating opportunities. First, I would say most obviously, investing in companies that will benefit or that have benefited from AI. NVIDIA, Microsoft, Google, the usual suspects, right? 
this theme, this trend is here to stay and it should not be ignored by advisors. As a simple example, the market capitalization of NVIDIA has gained nearly 900 billion US dollars in less than a year. That's 4% of the US GDP. 4% of the US GDP by one company in one year. It's stunning. So if you miss that, your clients are likely to hold it against you. But just like any other sector or asset class, investing in AI companies has its ups and downs and identifying the winners at the right price is certainly not easy. The second area of opportunity is that AI is bringing huge productivity enhancements to the operations and the processes of an advisor's practice. This includes automating time-consuming tasks, personalizing financial advice for each client individually, responding to queries automatically, remaining compliant. All these tasks that take up a lot of time, a lot of bandwidth and mind space for advisors. Uh, we've seen a number of custodians and temps like JP Morgan and BNY Mellon, uh, Morgan Stanley, Tiffin, develop AI-assisted advisor platforms for that very purpose. And especially with the advent of ChatGPT and large language models. So such a platform is coming to an advisor near you very soon. Last but not least, we have AI-powered investment tools and strategies. This is a continuation and expansion of quantitative portfolio management, where AI and machine learning, and in fact, other scientific techniques are used to analyze vast amounts of data that would be nearly impossible or too time consuming for humans to do. The purpose is to identify trends, generate ideas, identify re and reduce risks, automate the generation of alpha, remove human bias, and ultimately build stronger, safer portfolios. That is the field of AI-powered, AI-driven investment management. It's one of the toughest nuts to crack for AI. This is also where Queensfield AI Technologies has built its expertise and track record over the years. And this is going to be the main topic of the podcast today, the extraction of value and of alpha using AI technologies. Well, let's uh, talk about that. You mentioned earlier that it's a big challenge to identify winners uh, at the right price. How does AI solve that problem? How does it, it, it work? What is it really good at? Artificial intelligence makes it possible to analyze huge amounts of data and to identify complex trends that would be nearly impossible to detect otherwise. Um, it's important to realize most of the AI tools, tools offered in the market today are based on a fundamental paradigm. Features are driving outcome. What we mean by that is that these tools use vast quantities of input data called features as they seek to find to identify complex relationships between featured features and a desired outcome. In this case, the desired outcome, of course, is you know, which stock or which asset class is expected to outperform. Um, there are broadly four types of features that those large models use today. Macro, technical, fundamental, and sentiment slash alternative. So let's walk through them one by one. The macro features include the economy, GDP, currencies, inflation, interest rates, money supply, fiscal policy, all the things that affect the overall economy at a macro level. The technical features include, obviously, the trading volumes, the trends, momentum, volatility, moving averages, time series, and a host of more or less sophisticated mathematical analysis. Chartism, it's often called. 
Third, fundamental features include includes the ones that are related specifically to companies. So what's a company's strategy, its competitive positioning, revenue outlook, earnings quality, valuation multiples, earnings guidance, the track record of management, the analyst recommendations, all those things that have to do with the company. And finally, sentiment and other alternative features. Those are maybe a newer category. They include the analysis of free text, speeches and written content, social media, company's announcement, the detection of tone of voice when executives make statements, uh, satellite imaging, weather patterns, a number of things that are seemingly not related. But you have a lot of uh, AI models today that vacuum up all this information and try to identify relationships. All in all, some of the AI models that are available may analyze more than 100 factor or one, one, more than 100 feature in parallel and in real time, while also taking into account the historical evolution of these, of these features. So artificial intelligence not only allows to predictively measure the dependency and the relationship between features and the expected outcome, but sometimes they even allow to uncover relationship, relationships that were previously unidentified. So it is very powerful. So macro, te technical, fundamental, and sentiment, uh, it all sounds very promising. I know you've done some research in this area looking at the performance of AI-driven strategies. What have been the results? What has the performance been? You're, you're right, Bob. It's very promising, but there is a catch. And I call this the elephant in the room. So far, the performance has not lived up to expectations. Um, today, AI-driven strategies are available in, in two varieties. The first one are private funds, separately managed accounts that are offered by certain specialized quantitative asset managers or hedge funds. The second one is through ETFs. There are ETFs listed on the public markets that are AI-powered or AI-driven or AI-enhanced. You know, they, they carry different names. So let's observe the ETFs because that's public information. If you look back a bit, the first true AI-powered ETF came out about five years ago. Today, that category consists of about a dozen such ETFs. Some are broad-based, while others pursue more specific factor styles such as momentum or value. Now, looking at performance, if you analyze the combined performance of or AI-powered ETF as an asset class. Let's say we look at the top 10 most well-known ones and you aggregate their performance from their inception and you compare that to the S&P. The AI-enhanced ETF category has returned just over 60% in five years, while the S&P has returned 93% over that time. So one and a half times more than the AI category. And this is disappointing. It's disappointing because, first of all, those technologies are expected to do things we can't do, so you would expect them to outperform. But secondly, over those past five years, we've certainly had all sorts of market conditions. We've had bull markets, we had bear markets, we've had crashes and stunning recoveries and everything in between. And you would have thought that this diversity of markets would have given the opportunity for AI to shine but it really hasn't. So now a couple of words of qualifying qualification. First, it must be noted that within this overall underperformance, significant differences exist between the performance of each of the constituent ETFs in the composite. Some have done okay, some have not. Um, I'll let your audience, Bob, investigate further on a case-by-case -case basis, on an ETF-by-ETF -ETF basis. But it's fair to say that very few AI-enhanced ETFs within that composite have consistently outperformed their benchmarks. So an equal or equal weighted portfolio of those top 10 ETFs significantly underperformed, but there's a fair amount of variation within that relatively small sample size. I guess it's surprising and disappointing. What, what's going on? Why has that been the case? Yeah, you've summed it up perfectly right. 
Um, in our analysis, there's several reasons that can explain this, uh, these results. First, as we mentioned, some of the AI-driven ETFs are factor-focused. They seek value or momentum or international stocks or sometimes even multi-assets. They rotate from asset to asset. So even when their AI algorithms do work, the investment style they pursue may fall out of fashion for some time and they will end up underperforming the broader index. A second reason is that a, a valid relationship between a feature or a number of features and an outcome that has been correctly detected in the past may at some point break down when markets condition change or when edge cases are encountered or punctuated events. This is an important one. The AI models, because they use an increasing number of inputs and features, they may end up correlating too many features to properly separate true signal from noise. Or what they end up giving you is, here are 87 reasons why that stock will do well or will not do well. And then it's up to the user to decide, okay, well, which of those 87s do I want to bet on? So that sometimes comes to, to confuse the, the end result. And, and finally, most of these models, and including ours, use backtesting. You know, you come up with an algorithm, and then you look back in time and you test how it would have done had you used it. That's backtesting. And the backtesting used to train and calibrate AI models may contain bias, or it may contain what's called overfitting or underfitting, that is, allocating too much weight or not enough weight on certain inputs. So to put it differently, the larger the number of inputs or features, the more complex the model, and the more difficult it is to analyze the results and build strategies. So for all these reasons, the strategies and ETFs that we can see, ultimately they have been built by asset managers. All of these reasons come in, and to our understanding, this, is, this explains why no one has really consistently cracked that code yet. Equities are the building blocks of any successful portfolio. From satellite exposure to core allocations, advisors must understand the best way to wield equities. Join Vetify on September 21st for the Equity Symposium and hear from industry experts and thought leaders. Register at etftrends.com slash webcasts slash equities symposium. That's E-Q-U-I-T-I-E-S. We're looking forward to seeing you there. Where do we go from here? This is a, a pretty damning condemnation that you've given in terms of the fact that these uh, strategies have suffered from bad decision making, from the inability to differentiate signal from noise, from over reliance on back testing. Uh, are you saying this just doesn't work? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> and we are we're in this industry to make friends, not enemies. So uh, I'm just trying to be as transparent and as balanced for your audience. Um, we have a view and we're trying to share it, but we're very positive about the AI tools and we believe they have great promises for, for a number of reasons. They're extremely powerful to make the best use of an ever increasing amount of data. They're a great aid to in-depth analysis. They allow to automate decision-making and in certain cases, they can remove the bias or the human-induced jitters that may occur in extreme market conditions. Importantly, we, we believe that as more and more managers embrace AI strategies and use AI strategies in order to compete, the results will normalize and artificial intelligence will become a standard factor in the market, just like momentum or value or growth or you know, even ESG for that matter. When ESG came out, a lot of people said, well, you know, you're going to penalize a portfolio because you're worrying about things that are not related to strict investment performance. Yet today, ESG is a perfectly acceptable and commonly followed asset class. So we are very positive, but one needs to be aware of the limitations. I want to ask a somewhat philosophical question. 
what is the limit of artificial intelligence when it comes to investment management? Are there investment related tasks that can only be done by humans and will never be fodder for AI applications? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, AI is a tool. It's a very powerful tool, but it's a tool nonetheless. It's math. It's not magic. And as such, it has to be viewed as any other tool at the disposal of asset management professionals. You know, in the same way as when the HP 12C came out, for example, Hewlett Packard came out with a financial calculator and it immediately gave an edge to those who could use and program it. Uh, anecdotally, I looked online and I saw that you can still buy a new HP 12C for $49. Hopefully AI will be there in 50 years. More philosophically, AI will not transform a poor asset manager into a great one, but it will help good ones stay on top. We think that in order to be a smart user of AI, you do need to understand investment management thoroughly, and you need to have strong foundations about markets and about company analysis. As the saying goes, AI will not replace your financial advisor, but an advisor will, with AI will. So I would say that's the, 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 the philosophical um, wrapper. Now, a couple of more specific points. One issue we often uh, hear about is, is programming bias. It's often said that AI removes bias from investment decision making because it looks at facts and figure. And it's true. AI can be programmed to analyze and decide entirely based on fact and figures. But you still need to build a strategy behind it. And you still need to assess the risk return appetite or aversions of your clients. And this is done by humans, and it should remain that way, at least for the foreseeable, the foreseeable future. Uh, I'll not go into the ethical questions that AI raises everywhere else in the world, right? About data and personalization and the fact that it, it may know yourself better than yourself. That's, that's a limiting factor and that's sometimes a, a point, a point to, to take into account. And I'll, I'll finish with a, a final one, which is a point often misunderstood, is the fact that AI is a black box. I don't think it's true. If, if the AI model is well built, by definition, it will do what it's been trained to do. And the model should not venture into the wilderness on its own. However, as, as we've mentioned, the results are sometimes so complex and so broad that explaining them is beyond the reach of most users. So when you have something that says, we chose this stock because the model told us to, it's not a very satisfactory answer. But if you've used correctly the math to build it, you should have a proper answer for the outcome. At least we do in the, in the way we do things. So yeah, it has, uh, it has its limitations. And I think the challenge today is to iron these out and, and converge into a market standard that will be commonly accepted and that will be a help and not, not a hindrance and certainly not a risk. Let's talk about how you do things. Cleanfield AI Technologies is itself an AI-powered quantitative finance R&D firm. What do you bring to the table? Well, we, we certainly try to bring something. The market doesn't need yet another online portfolio builder. We combine the passion of cutting edge academic research with real life grit and experience of veteran asset managers. Just a couple of words about who we are and, and, and what we do. Queensfield is the fruit of nearly 10 years of specific R&D in artificial intelligence applied to quantitative finance. And we started well before it was fashionable. Our patented technologies have been researched in, in some of the most advanced academic PhD programs in machine learning. Actually, the founder is himself the head of the machine learning program at Imperial College London, in addition to being a veteran asset manager and a director of the board of directors of BNP Paribas. For the last few years, our solutions have been due diligence, endorsed and purchased by blue chip institutional clients and asset managers, investment banks and hedge funds. Our public indices are ad administered and calculated by Mercube, a, a partner of ours, which is a venture company backed by JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, UBS, Citigroup, Allianz and Intel. So as blue chip as it gets. And what makes us different is our technologies. I've talked extensively about features and, and the benefits, but the drawbacks that they carry. 
we do not use features as input into our models. Our input data is simple, our output is actionable, and our value added comes from a unique combination of several proprietary protocols that include signal processing, supervised and unsupervised machine learning, and contest theory. So that's how we differentiate ourselves and, and that's what we bring to the table. Explain what you mean by the fact that you're not using features. Does that mean you're a missing part of the picture? How do you achieve your results in, in that context? Yes, it's, it's a very important point. Um, as, as we mentioned, many of the invest models available today in AI rely on a paradigm features drive outcome. If you can find the relationship between features and outcome, you've got yourself a predictive algorithm. But we've also seen empirically the limitations and the disappointing results of this approach. Queensfield AI Technologies has simply disrupted this vision over several years of thorough, I would say, obsessive R&D in artificial intelligence coming from our quantitative finance. AI technologies that we have perfected are not tied to any particular feature. They do not follow the paradigm features to outcome approach. So, so how do we do it? Simply, we do not analyze features, at least not in the way traditional models do. Instead, we seek to quantify the intentions of the community of investors and their evolving actions and reactions, rather than identifying how all of the features in the world evolve. We focus on the end signal rather than the input. Using both a top-down and a bottom-up analysis, we track the evolution of the risk aversion and risk appetite of investors towards each stock, as well as the degree of consensus or divergence. So instead of a features to outcome model, we've built an investor preference to outcome model. And so we let investors do their analytical jobs. Our goal is to understand the evolution of their views and learn from its dynamics. Um, in terms of data, we use what investors give us, which is mainly prices, stock prices, index prices, option prices. And these have already factored in all the features that they can access. From there, our output consists of two, signal, two signals. One is the overall risk regime in the market. The other is single stock ratings and rankings by sector and by stock. All our model strategies are built using these signals. How can advisors access your strategies? I would say quite simply, for advisors, we offer five model strategies that cover the spectrum of investor needs. That is core, growth, defensive, value, and broad. So nothing that they've not used before, nothing that they would not recognize or would be able to explain to their clients. Each of the model strategies uses our proprietary patented technologies and offers a consistent risk return profile that allows the construction of well thought out portfolios. The strategies are designed to be traded by the advisor and most of them contain no more than 25 stocks. So they're easy and they're cost effective to rebalance. They're long only, they do not use any expensive or complex derivative products or short selling. So advisors get daily allocation files that allow them to rebalance as and when needed using their trading platform and their custodian. And the de description obviously of the strategies and, and the results are available in the links to the podcast. So it's a, uh, basically you're running a model, you, there's no ETF or, or investment product that's available to U.S. investors. Uh, talk briefly about the performance and, and what your plans are for rolling this out to U.S. investors. Sure, sure. Well, Bob, you will not be surprised if I caveat my response with the perennial disclaimer. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. But... Our strategies have performed very well. Our signals have been calculated live every day since the beginning of 2020. The math is eight years old, as I said, but daily signals, live signals, they're now over three and a half years old. Since that date, our 
flagship signal, our flagship strategy, has returned 77%. That is just about twice the return of the S&P 500, which was 39% during that time. On a compounded basis, on an annual compounded basis, we have outperformed the S&P by over 500 basis points per year. And this has been achieved with a volatility that is at or below that of the benchmark, resulting in a sharp ratio that is 40% above that of the S&P 500. Um, those are great results. Uh, we're not financial advisors, we're not regulated. That's why we go through third-party index providers and so on. Um, but from our understanding and from interacting with advisors and asset managers in the market, we have identified a new signal and we've been able to quantify it. And this is resulting in, in, those, um, in those results. Uh, you've asked about the rotation, the frequency rotation and the um, the turnover of the portfolio. So they're very modest. They're very compatible with retail investment management. The, the rotation occurs in two ways. Once is when we identify risk conditions that deserve to be more or less invested in the market. And, and the other one, of course, is when the company makes it into or out of our top ranked category. Um, so it's, it's very manageable when it comes to trading the, the retail. Um, we also had a discussion about cost, you know, how much does it cost and what's in it for the advisors? As, as you mentioned, our clients today tend to be large institutional asset managers who have diligenced the product for years. We are introducing this strategy to the US market. And um, our models are made to be simple to use and to be cost effective and to be flexible. We haven't yet pegged a price number yet. Uh, I would like to engage with you, with your audience, you know, in all, in all honesty. I'd like to engage and uh, explain what we do, uh, explain how we can work together and come up with a, with a you know, pricing scheme that works for everyone. It would make sense for this to be somehow related to the overall size and AUMs of the advisors. Um, and we're also open to have a um, performance-based compensation because we stand behind what we sell. Great. Well, we'll include information for contacting you in the notes that accompany this podcast. If there's one key takeaway that you'd like to leave with our audience of advisors about how they should evaluate AI-based investment strategies, what would that be? Yeah, that's, that's, that's really the great way to, to end. Uh, obviously, we feel that AI is a breakthrough in wealth management that is transforming the way clients are served. As an advisor, it is important to identify early on which tools are right for you and for your clients. So the takeaway is to choose a partner that has both the asset management vision and the AI credentials. This should enhance the value of the advisory practice. Great. So the vision and the credentials. Well, we'll include some links in the notes that accompany this podcast where you'll be able to learn more about Val and Queensfield. There'll be a link to the Queensfield AI Technologies website, a link to its product brochure that's called Five Model Strategies. Uh, there'll be two links that go to uh, Queensfield's AI public indices. And there'll be a link uh, to a white paper on the performance of AI powered ETFs. And lastly, there'll be a link that will let you connect with Val on LinkedIn. Val, is there anything else you'd like to add? Yes, there is, Bob. As you said in the intro, AI is transformational and advisor perspectives and Vetafi are at the forefront of these evolutions. So I would like to thank you very much for having me on this podcast and for giving me a voice. You're welcome. And I'd love to have you back uh, again in the future and revisit this topic and, and see what progress your strategies, and the rest of the AI world has made. Thank you for listening to the Gaining Perspective podcast with Bob Hoopscher, today featuring Valerie Talma of Queensfield AI Technologies. To support our podcast, please share, subscribe, or leave a review to help make our podcast more findable for your friends and colleagues. You can subscribe to Gaining Perspective on your favorite podcasting service. 